So I'm Kersten. Uh, I'm a partner with McKinsey. I lead our Center for Future Mobility, which is our think tank on the mobility disruption. Um, in my uh, McKinsey work, I have a team of roughly 200 people globally. Not I have a team. We have a team of 200 people globally that do work on very little except the future of mobility across all of the different topics. In that, we have a small dedicated team that does nothing but micromobility, uh, forecasts, consumer su surveys, and many, many other things. And what I would like to share with you today is our seven key insights. And why seven? Because when I joined McKinsey about 13 years ago, I was told you always need three points. You can also do five. And I asked, can I do seven? Yes, okay, you can do seven. Uh, if you work in China, you can also do eight, by the way, but that's a different story. But it's, today it's seven. So I'm going to talk about market sizing. I'm going to do a deep dive into electric bikes. Uh, I'm going to talk about mini mobility. Uh, which is basically L6, L7 vehicles. I'm going to talk about consumer preferences and about regulation. And let me start with our market sizing update. So basically, um, we've, we've always continuously started modeling the market for micromobility ever since I, for the first time, saw Horace speak at a totally different event in, in Germany called Das Tegernsee. And one of our senior partners said, Kerstin, micromobility, that's the next big thing. We need to get into that. We need a perspective. And I said, okay, we'll do it. And that's why we're here today. And I'm still a big fan, also using it personally, but market sizing. So what you can see is it's growing. That's the very, very simple, uh, very, very simple um, uh, thing here. It's very much going to be a Europe centric market if you think about the growth. So we believe that most of the market growth is actually going to happen in Europe with all of the other countries, all of the other pockets growing as well. And there is growth in every single pocket. It's just a bit of question of differences in geographies, differences in vehicle types, differences in sharing versus ownership. Um, going into electric bicycles. So electric bicycles today already sizable. Right, already a big, big market um, within um, uh, within within the bicycle market. I think everybody's probably read recent reports that bicycle sales in some countries are dropping these days, whereas e-bike sales are still growing massively. And we do believe that this trend is going to continue. And again, it's a Europe thing. So we had a long chat when we sort of came up with these numbers about why is this so big? Why is Europe dominating this so much? Why is, for example, the US? Yes, growing massively, but fairly small. Um, and we think there is good reason for it. And we're pretty confident in these numbers. But in our mind, Europe for electric bicycles, that's, that's the main market. That's the key market. Um, Going on to to the next one, and um, 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 and this is, sorry, and this is this is our forecast. So it's not only about today, but Europe is basically also expected to be the main market growing forward, right? And then if you now take a look at what is happening, take the U.S. numbers for example versus the Europe numbers. We had a hard time believing that this could actually be the case. But then if you really look into who's using the bikes, what the average price is for the vehicle, uh, where this is going, where this is developing, and so on, this is where we're, again, pretty confident that these are the numbers. Moving on into, um, uh, into mini mobility. So mini mobility is something where we basically stole Horace's term or the term for micro mobility, or not stole, but let's say borrowed for, for better use of words, and said, okay, this is anything that's L6, L7 vehicle. So it's basically anywhere between, let's say, a cargo bike and a very, very small car. And I think there are tons of vehicles that I've seen here. I've actually seen also tons of vehicles on the street of Amsterdam yesterday driving in. Not necessarily electric and not necessarily the type of vehicle that well, is, let's say, the vehicle that's going to have these numbers here. But in our mind, it's very sizable. Why is it sizable? Because we did our TAM-SAM sort of SOM logic and, and looked at how many people could actually use that vehicle and also would be willing to use that vehicle, either as an extension to the private vehicle or as a complete replacement. And again, as you can see the numbers, I mean, you know we like big numbers, but it's a very sizable market. And we on purpose didn't put a time stamp here. So this doesn't say the market is the 2030 market. We say it's actually, theoretically, it's the market today. So if you ask people today, would they be willing to buy such a vehicle? And if these vehicles were around, this is what the market potential is. It then obviously depends on the respective form factor. It depends on the respective um, uh, location and so on. But again, pretty sizable market. And for us, one of the big next thing in this broader micro mobility space, uh, these vehicles that are, again, somewhere between um, um, uh, cargo bikes and uh, small private cars or L6 and L7. 
Um, regulation, and we published something about this this morning. It's a complete coincidence that we published it today, obviously. Um, we did take a look at 100 cities globally and um, took a look at what is the regulation for shared micromobility, or specifically for shared e-kick scooters. Um, and we try to understand a bit what are different regulatory archetypes, how do these cities cluster, what are the patterns, and then we obviously also have a forecast how this is going to evolve. And by the way, we do believe it's going to go more into uh, tender regulated um, uh, types of cities. But ultimately, what you can see is three archetypes. We've tried to come up with the, how these uh, 980 million people that live in these cities are distributed across these archetypes. China is obviously driving a lot of the part that is entirely banned. So all of the folks basically living in large Chinese cities that um, uh, are basically have banned e kick scooters. And then everything that is no regulation in place is basically mostly uh, Middle East and Africa where there simply is no regulation in place yet today, and then everything else is in between, overly simplified. But ultimately, we've, we've made this analysis, and I honestly thought that, this, um, uh, that the tender regulated and open regulated environments would make up a smaller share. And if we had done this analysis a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, it would have made a, a smaller share. And I'm really excited to see if we redo this in 12 months or 8, 24 months, how this is going to evolve. Again, pretty sure that more and more is going to go into tender regulated and open regulated environment. And I personally hope not more cities are going to ban shared kick scooters like Paris did, but that's, that's a different story. Um, consumer insights. So we, we were asking what mode would you actually like to use? Uh, and we did that across geographies. You can see there are some patterns that are fairly similar across uh, the big three that we surveyed. We did Germany a bit as a representation of, um, uh, of Europe, well knowing that there are other countries that are much more advanced on micromobility than, than Germany, and then China and the US. And what you can see is, is one, the e-bicycle is ultimately dominating, right? It's the most popular form factor, if you will. Uh, and this is then surprising if you try and ping, uh, play that back with the numbers we recently saw or saw three pages ago on the US and the e-bike e -bike market sizing because it doesn't really, doesn't really work together. Um, and then what is interesting is mini mobility, right? Because you do see that mini mobility or these L6, L7 vehicles, something that isn't really around, still has a certain share of popularity and it's especially in the US. So the US folks seem to like larger vehicles over smaller ones. Um, we asked, how would you like to use these mini mobility vehicles, so L6, L7 vehicles? Would it be replacement, extension, or um, uh, replacement or extension, mostly, actually? And what you can see is both is the simple term, right? However, the whole idea of extending the private vehicle is winning in most geographies, right? So more people say, hey, I can imagine not only having my car, but keeping my car and then having a smaller vehicle, probably for certain trips within the city um, uh, to, to use that. And I think it's an interesting thing. Um, we've always thought that micro-mobility, mini-mobility, mobility in general is going to be a portfolio game, at least for, for those sort of who are able to afford it. But in our mind, what is going to happen is people are going to spend less on cars, i.e. replacing them less frequently, maybe buying cheaper cars, even though Horace just showed that prices are going up, and that's, that's a fact, obviously. Uh, and then ultimately getting more mobility options that, that people own. And why is that? Like, why do we think that it's going to be a portfolio game? Because ultimately, ownership is something that people like. It's unfortunately still something that people like for mobility, for many, many other things as well. That's why car sharing has taken up, but hasn't sort of skyrocketed yet. Um, but we also do believe that for smaller vehicles, private ownership, or at least having a dedicated vehicle, you might also be paying for it by leasing, by subscription, by financing, is something that is going to be super relevant also in the longer term, simply because it's convenient simply because you can take these vehicles with you into different location, and then simply also because, in some cases, people simply don't like sharing still. So we asked people, why do you actually uh, prefer private ownership over that? Simply, the idea of not sharing with anybody else is still a major factor. Flexibility, carrying the vehicle, for example, on the bus, so also making that first and last mile connection with public transit was a very important point. And I think we've seen uh, uh, very, very many vehicles that you could actually could actually carry very easily onto public transit. Um, and then we also do see that shared micromobility is a bit of an entry ticket for many people. So many people try the scooters, try the bikes, 
And at a certain point in time, they found out, hey, I can actually replace a lot of my trips with these types of vehicles uh, and, don't need, uh, and, and, and don't need anything else anymore. And then ultimately, I'm going to buy such a vehicle. So that's a bit the psychology, why we included the 22% that say, yes, tried it, was convinced, and bought it. Um, our seven key insights, again, summarized, no worries. This is the sort of old McKinsey kind of page with lots of uh, uh, text and uh, lots of data and uh, very hard to read, but I think maybe uh, something to take a photo of. We'll also share these pages um, uh, and make them available to you, obviously. Um, and yeah, last but not least, so we like micro mobility and mini mobility. We are very passionate about mobility in general. One thing that you may not know about McKinsey is it's not only us working with big corporates. We do that obviously, and uh, it is our bread and butter, but we also like working with uh, innovative companies, startups and scale ups, investors in the micro, mini, doesn't matter, future of mobility space. So uh, if there's ever anything that is interesting, we can do uh, a, lot of, a lot of work in market sizing. We help companies make investor presentations better. We also uh, work with companies to scale up their business. So whenever there's something, you know how to find us, you know where to reach us. Thank you so much. Thanks for attending this session. Thanks for sticking around. It's always difficult to talk after Horace. It's a great slot, but it's also a difficult slot because, well, it's Horace. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day, a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so we're going to do something a little bit improvised, which is I'm going to see if the audience has any questions. And before uh, I can actually try to see if they have any questions, um, I want to ask you a question. Okay, so I'm looking at your numbers, and you're saying in terms of uh, Europe, the EU, that actually that's where you think most of the growth is going to happen. Why? Like, I don't necessarily believe you, and you seem like an extremely credible person, but at the same time, if you just look at the population sizes, if you look at the already, um, uh, the two-wheeler and three-wheeler uh, market penetration in places like India, it just seems to me like we're gonna actually see more replacements of two-wheelers and three-wheelers in countries like that, where there's already very high penetration than we are in Europe. So um, it's a great question. One we've actually also asked ourselves and, and my colleagues Darius and so on, they've gotten many, many challenging questions from us internally, like why? Why are these numbers like, like they are? Why are you forecasting it that way? I think my answer is um, we've looked into climate change targets of European cities, climate change commitments, and very simply put, there is no way to reach these climate change targets that the cities have put into ambitions just by electrifying private cars. It doesn't work. Unless you were to do massive uh, cash for clunkers for ICE vehicles, and even then, it doesn't work. So you need something else. And what is that something else? I think you can very well see it in Amsterdam. It's micromobility. That's going to help. We also need other things like autonomous shuttles and so on. That's a different story. But I think there's simply no way around it. If we want to keep the planet habitable, if we want to make um, uh, the 0.5 degree target a reality, which might already be difficult, to be honest, uh, we need this. Mm. And I honestly think that people are, I hope that people, that all of us, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here, but also everybody else is smart enough to realize that we need this. Yeah, interesting. And that's also what you're seeing in some of the surveys and the data that you're doing too, right? Absolutely. It's like in yeah. terms of why people are choosing this, yeah. you mentioned there's really two reasons, right? It's like the, the speed and the um, uh, sort of facility of the vehicle itself, plus uh, how it addresses climate. So because we're on the city and policy stage then, what do you think are the policies that cities need to pass in order to uh, get to this um, uh, level of uh, adoption? So I think it's a, it's a combination of multiple things. I think we need also not policy, we need infrastructure to a certain extent. We need the, I'm not going to say it right, but what the bike streets that they have here in, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, we need that. Mm. We need better protection for, um, uh, for bike riders, for micro-mobility riders to make it work. That's for sure. I think the other thing we need is we need a way to either incentivize micro-mobility or disincentivize private car usage. And there is multiple ways how to do it. There is congestion charges. There is city tolling. All of these are fairly aggressive and, and very visible. There's also simple stuff like taking away parking spots, like putting in speed limits, um, like uh, actually controlling and enforcing these speed limits. So I'll give you an example of Stuttgart in Germany, home to, I don't know, 300,000 people somehow working and making their money off of the auto industry. They have a 30 kilometers an hour speed limit, 40 during the day in the inner ring, where you have a speed camera literally every 80 meters. So there is simply no reason to go anywhere above it. There's also no reason to accelerate when you start off the traffic light, which is something that people in Stuttgart all driving Porsches and AMG Mercedes actually like to do. So, so I, think, I think that's really, another yeah. one. Honestly, if, if you were to ask me, 
Um, but this is something that's not necessarily a popular opinion, not even within McKinsey. Um, city tolls and mm -hmm. a massive, massive, massive tax on new car registrations oh, to make, to make yeah, that happen and to really disincentivize the usage. Sure. It's not going to be popular with the auto industry, that's for sure. And it's, it might also create some economic impact, but I think that's the way in cities where how we need to get to And it. even electric vehicles, new electric vehicle registration. I mean, an electric vehicle ultimately consumes <laughs> the same space as a, as a conventional car, right? Yeah. So the, and, and actually people are getting even more, even larger vehicles because the first electric vehicles that are being launched now they're largely SUVs, so there's this SUV trend. People don't feel that bad for driving an SUV when they have an electric car because it's supposedly green. So, Interesting. Okay. Let me see if there's maybe one audience question. And then, ah, yes. Okay. I'm, we don't have a roaming mic yet, so I'm going to verbalize what I hear you say. Hi. My name is Baron Kohas. I'm an urbanist and architect and industrial designer. Um, my question is, have any calculations been made on the the costs that you can save on infrastructure if you use micro mobility mm -hmm. instead of cars. So let's say building less roads, less parking garages, creating more space for greenery in the streets, more uh, biodiversity, more space for, for social interaction, you know, again, gains that you can make. Um. So I'm going to, so the question was, um, uh, have any calculations been made what the savings can be for infrastructure if you actually transition to a more micromobility centric world? Um, yes, uh, and, and I think it, it very much depends on a city by city level. We've looked at it for a few cities to quantify the benefit of a change in modal mix more broadly, right? Because it's not only micromobility, there's also other things. You can assume it's in the billion of euros for a city uh, on a on a five year sort of five year budget level. It's we're talking very very high numbers. It always depends a lot what size the city is, and it also depends a lot how radically you would change it. But it's the numbers are simply massive, quote unquote. I mean, you could say okay, we then need to calculate against it the tax uh, earnings from uh, all of the vehicle registrations, all of the petroleum taxes, all of the energy taxes, and so on. And then the number becomes smaller. That's that's true. We we don't we can't negate that. But I think the pure infrastructure savings, if you really sort of start eventually redesigning the cities and not start all or not keep all of the maintenance up of the roads that you need, it's it's very very sizable.